This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, the U.S. fertility rate has reached a historic low. We've had a cumulative decline since the beginning of the Great Recession that adds up to something which is quite significant. What the numbers really mean, according to one expert, when Radio Health Journal returns. Seventy percent of medical decisions are based on the findings of pathologists who also diagnose virtually all cancers. Given the importance of these decisions, the nation's largest and most complex laboratories ensure they're operating at the highest standards through inspection and accreditation by the College of American Pathologists. CAP inspects and accredits laboratories in 19 of the 20 top hospitals in the recent U.S. News and World Report rankings. Dr. Richard Friedberg is the CAP president. The CAP's laboratory accreditation program is internationally recognized as the most rigorous set of standards in laboratory science. Forty percent of the nearly 3,000 items on our inspection checklist exceed regulatory compliance because a patient's health is on the line. Every CAP inspection team includes one pathologist and a team of laboratory professionals. The CAP's exhaustive inspection checklists are updated annually to help laboratories stay on the cutting edge of medicine. Find out more at cap.org slash news. Birth rates in the United States are dropping. In fact, they've fallen to a record low for women in all age groups under 30, according to the Centers for Disease Control's annual report on births in the United States. Since 2015, the fertility rate has dropped 1%, but that's only the latest in a pattern of decline over the past 10 years. A 1% decline in and of itself in the general fertility rate isn't a big thing. But we've had a cumulative decline since the beginning of the Great Recession that adds up to something which is quite significant. At the same time that the fertility rate has declined, we've also had a decline in net immigration. And if you put the two of those together and the more recent pattern continues, we're going to have a much older population in the future than we had been expecting up until just a few years ago. That's Richard Jackson, president and founder of the Global Aging Institute. He says decline in the birth rate matters a lot. The birth rate affects the future rate of growth in the working population and hence the future rate of economic growth. Given the fact that it affects the future ratio of working age adults to elderly and hence the future fiscal burden for programs like Social Security and Medicare, I think there is a significant amount of concern. Fertility has declined elsewhere in the developed world, but before these most recent trends, the U.S. was an exception. It's important really to understand how unusual the United States was. A demographer named Nicholas Eberstadt at the American Enterprise Institute coined the term American demographic exceptionalism to sort of underscore this difference between the United States and our other developed world peers. And the reasons for that exceptionalism are several, I think. For example, Jackson says that prior to the recession, it was easy for young people to develop independent households in the U.S. compared with young people in Europe or Japan. In America, it was also easier to launch a career as youth unemployment was low compared with those countries. But since the recession, Jackson believes that trends in the housing and job markets have eroded the confidence that young people once had about their future income prospects. What accounts for the shift in the overall number is declines in births among women in their 20s. The birth rates for women in their 30s and early 40s have actually gone up slightly. It's dictated by the economic situation, and it's a deliberate decision. Now, what we don't know, and this is a critical unknown, is whether millennials are simply postponing births. In other words, whether as women now in their 20s enter their 30s, whether they'll catch up and recoup some of the births that they didn't have in their 20s, or whether we're looking at a permanent shift in cohort behavior towards a smaller desired completed family size. However, better job prospects for younger women wouldn't automatically mean more children being born. Paradoxically, in more traditional societies like Japan or Korea or Italy, I mean, trying to keep women in the kitchen doesn't get you more babies. It gets you 
fewer babies and fewer workers. And if you enable women and more broadly families, men are obviously part of the story too, to balance jobs and babies, then you end up with more of both. Although he is concerned, Jackson makes sure to point out that fertility rates are all relative. Even if we remain at a 1.8 total fertility rate, that still puts us towards the high end among the rich countries. What that means is that we'll look demographically in the future more like Sweden or the Netherlands or France. We'll have a bigger aging challenge, but it will still be a challenge, I think, that can be met with the appropriate policy adjustments. The recent decline in the birth rate, and even coupled with the recent decline in net immigration, doesn't mean that we're going to look like Germany or Japan. Take Japan, for example. Jackson says the country is ground zero for global aging. Their fertility rate has been below replacement value for longer than any other developed country. So Jackson says world record life expectancy plus a cultural aversion to migration has left Japan with the oldest population in the world. Japan is on track to lose roughly half of its current population by the end of the century if the birth rate doesn't come back up. So what does this decline really mean for the United States? Nobody's arguing. I'm certainly not arguing. You know, that we should want to go back to baby boom fertility levels. I think rapid population growth, most of us would agree, you know, would pose its own set of challenges and concerns. But something close to replacement fertility, maybe supplemented by some net immigration, is probably a better place to be demographically and economically than far beneath replacement with a rapidly contracting and rapidly aging population. Prior to these recent developments, I was not one who argued that the U.S. needed to raise its birth rate. It seemed to me it was pretty much at an optimal level. But the recent decline has been significant and has, I think, become a cause for concern. Amidst all of that, Jackson says there is a silver lining, the 9% decline in the teenage birth rate over the past year. Part of the decline is accounted for by an ongoing, very steep decline in teenage births. So I think most of us would agree that that's a good thing. A lot of people would be surprised to learn that the birth rates to adolescents in the U.S. have been declining since around 1960. Dr. Elise Berlin is director of the Young Women's Contraception Program at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. The declines in the recent years have been associated with changes in contraceptive practices. You know, teens are becoming much better at using contraceptives, and that's really attributed for the main declines. I'm really encouraged by this because unintended pregnancy is pretty much a life-changing event for a teen. We really want to help them have a pregnancy that's desired and that's spaced at the right time in their life. So this data really supports that this is happening more and more. You can find out more about all our guests through links on our website, radiohealthjournal.net. Our writer-producer this week is Libby Foster. Our production director is Sean Waldron. I'm Nancy Benson. Medical notes this week. The death rate from stroke in the United States has been declining steadily for the last 40 years but now that progress has stalled. In fact, a report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that stroke rates have even started to rise again among Hispanics and people living in the so-called stroke belt in the South. Experts say about 80% of strokes are preventable with a reduction in high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes. Probiotics combined with immunotherapy could help kids get over peanut allergies. A new study in the journal Lancet Child and Adolescent Health finds that increasing doses of peanut protein along with the probiotic Lactobacillus rhamnosus cured allergies in 82% of allergic children. Lactobacillus rhamnosus is usually found in yogurt. Researchers say the procedure still needs more study. And finally, new dads in the United States are getting older. In fact, the average father is nearly 31 years old. That's up three and a half years in the last four decades. A study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that Asian Americans and men with more education are likely to be older dads. The typical newborn's father with a college degree is over 33 years old, and the average Asian American dad 
is 36. And that's Medical Notes this week. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTracks Communications. If you enjoyed this week's show, please leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on iTunes, Stitcher, and at RadioHealthJournal.net.